fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. I am the first and I am the last. And beside me there is no God. Sitting up there for about a month and did much the same thing that I'm going to do this morning, except we taught all month on music. It's too bad that we have to spend time teaching it and instead of just singing the right kind of music and making use of it in our lives. But uh, I don't know, a five-minute testimony, what can I tell you? I grew up wanting to be famous and popular and rich, and uh, most kids get that in them. They think I want to I wanna be well-known, I want to be well-liked, I want to have lots of money, and uh, that was what I aimed for. Well, it so happened when I was a teenager that rock and roll music was becoming popular. And I had played a clarinet and a little bit on the saxophone and had even taken up guitar. And so I thought, why don't I get in a rock and roll band? And then instead of being funny looking and made fun of, I'll be popular. And so I got myself in a rock and roll band with a couple of my band buddies. And away we went, or so we thought. And we went on with this for... Oh, I don't know. I think we ended up playing eight years total together and people came in the band and got out and we tried to play the most popular songs and, you know, I, I never really got rich. I never really got famous and I think I was well known in my state, but I don't know if I was really well liked. But I aimed at this because I thought it would give me joy and I never was happy. I threatened to quit that band once a week for most of the time that I played in it. It did not make me happy, and I thought I could find uh, joy just in music of all kinds, and I, I really couldn't do that either. And uh, finally, when I went to see a preacher's daughter, I forgot that her daddy was a saved man who preached the Word of God and told people how to get to heaven, and he taught his daughter to be a soul winner. I didn't even know what that was. So I asked her to a dance. I wanted to impress her. I thought she was pretty. It's not my wife. She's very pretty, but I'm not talking about her right now. And uh, I asked her if she'd go to a dance. She said, no, you play in bars, don't you? I said, yes. Well, I don't want to go to a bar. Uh, they serve liquor there. And I said, well, go to a high school dance. They don't serve liquor there. No, I don't want to be seen at the dance. I said, we'll sneak you in. She said, you'll still know that I'm there. And uh, I said, well, why don't you come to one of our band practices? We practice down in my friend's basement, and you can come hear our band. And I thought that would impress her. And she said, no, I don't believe I'll do that. And uh, anyway... And I said, well, I've met a lot of people, but everyone I know listens to rock music and goes to dances. And that's not true at all, but I thought it was. And uh, I said, why in the world don't you? My curiosity was killing me. By that time, her sister brought a Bible and threw it down on the table. And boy, did she start to fire the questions at me. Do you believe you're a sinner? And I was still trying to impress her. And I thought, well, I, yes, that must be the right answer. And I, I thought I surely couldn't say I'm not. Then she said, do you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God and born of a virgin and that He is God Himself and sinless? And I thought, I don't know what my church taught me, what did my church teach me. Yeah. And I thought I'd impress her again. I, she said, do you believe that uh, He died to save sinners? I've heard that before. Yes. Do you believe that you're a sinner? I already answered that. She said, well, then, if you're a sinner and Jesus Christ died to save sinners, didn't Jesus Christ die to save you? And I said, well, yes. And she said, well, if you die tonight, do you know that you go to heaven? And I said, I hope so. And I could tell right away from the look on her face that that was not the right answer. And I could not figure out what the right answer was. I thought, surely you don't want to say, I'd rather go to hell. I thought, what, what else can I answer? Then she said, I'm a sinner and you're a sinner, but. I know I'm going to heaven, and you only hope so. Alan, have you ever trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And I knew the answer was supposed to be yes. So I said, well, I think I've done that. Yes, I've done that already. And she shook her head at me, and she said, no. If you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you would know it. And you would not be wondering about heaven. And you would not be trying to think so hard just... See if you've already trusted the Lord. I think you need to call on the Lord and ask Him to save you. 
And she explained to me that I needed to trust what he'd done in dying for me on the cross and showed me scriptures for it. And uh, I thanked her for the visit. I was very uncomfortable and I left. I was on a bicycle, age 19, didn't have my license yet or didn't want to use it. My dad wouldn't let me use the car anyway. So I, I had the bicycle and I started to ride home and I began to think about what she said. And I didn't know what it was then, but the Holy Spirit of God had been convicting me while I sat there and I told her I was a sinner. I began to think about all the sins that I'd committed. And when I realized Jesus Christ loved me so much and died for me, I understood that his sacrifice was great for me. On the bicycle, I said, Lord, I don't know any Bible but what she showed me. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I said, but I don't want to go to hell. I want to be a real Christian. I want you to take me to heaven when I die. I want you to forgive all my sins. Come into my life. Come into my heart. And God, I didn't mean to miss anything. I want to make sure that I get saved today. Would you save me today? And the Lord saved me while I rode a bicycle on the way home. And uh, it was about two years of Bible it took. And I understood that a Christian could not be right with God and play in a rock and roll band or have anything to do with it. And so God, through the word of God, gave me strength to quit on the rock music. And by the way, that's that's why Christians read the Bible. It gives us strength. It is our faith. It it makes us overcome. We overcome the world. And so Lord delivered me from that, and I've never been so happy. I was more happy the day that I let go of rock music than the day that I got saved. It maybe shouldn't have been that way, but for me it was a, a total release, and I could enjoy my salvation, and I've been enjoying it ever since, and that's been a long time. It's Nineteen years I've been enjoying it. The first two years weren't very much fun. But uh, I'm glad the Lord saves my grace. I knew I couldn't get there any other way. And so that's my testimony in a, a real quick hurry. I'm looking for one sheet of paper. I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14. And then, Ellen, my trumpet is over there behind by the piano. You might want to bring that up and bring the saxophone and the strap up here for me. And I don't think I'll need the clarinet. I want to try and make some things plain to you in the area of music. And for those of you who were here last year, and those of you who heard your preacher preach things on music, I hope I can bring a few things that you haven't heard yet, just exactly this way. I'm going to look at four things in this area of music. And they are the words of songs, the melody to songs, the harmony to songs, and the rhythm of songs. And I want us to see from 1 Corinthians 14 that music paints pictures. Music paints pictures. If we understand that, we'll understand why we need to be careful of what we listen to. If we don't understand that, we'll go on just as blindly as we ever did and just listen to whatever we please. But let's look at 1 Corinthians 14. We'll read a verse or two, have a word of prayer, and then go on with some of these explanations. Verse 10, verse 10 of 1 Corinthians 14. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. We'll spend a lot of time just on that verse. Let's pray. Father, now during this Sunday school hour, be gracious. Help me to teach. Guide my thoughts. Help me not take more time than I have on each point. And we'll be uh, happy to praise you for that. Help me to give these people what they need. And may they hear from thy word and hear from heaven and anchor in on thy word. And Lord, may they sense thy spirit in this matter and be right in it with thee. That they might walk more closely to thee and they might stay out of trouble. And keep away from the music that will hinder their spirit and soul and body. In Jesus' name, amen. The verse we read is in a chapter about tongues. And there's a lot of confusion about tongues. And I think it's no mistake that this chapter includes a lot about music. There's a lot of confusion in the area of music. And Cor Corinth was a carnal church. And I don't think it's any accident that this chapter includes things on music in a church that was uh, carnal and probably had problems in the area of music as well. Let's back up from verse 10 just a little bit. And I want us to see some things. 
In verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 14, it says, Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. And he said that the best thing for a Christian to do is to take the Word of God and to teach it to others. And that is called prophesying. Prophesying. He said that's what you ought to aim for. And then he starts to mention this business of tongues. In verse 5, I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. He said the most important thing, if a man opens his mouth, is not how heavenly he thinks it is, but how much it will build up the others, if the church will be edifying. And in verse 6, he says, Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine? I guess we could say that, uh, that music is a type of tongues. It's kind of an unknown language to most people. No, nobody but a musician, and even some of them don't, really know why they play, what they play, and how they play it, and exactly what it is that they're saying. But they do know that they're saying something. And here begins, in verse 7, his inclusion of music in this explanation. And even things without life, given sound, whether pipe or harp, there they are, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harp? Just as a general rule, sounds have a distinct character about them. Now, if someone opened up all the doors and windows of this church building and they drove by and we were all singing, they should be able to tell by the sound of the music that we're making, though they'll never make out the words. They should be able to say, they're worshiping God in there today. They sound like they're happy and they sound like they are honoring the Lord. How many folks have tried to go up and down the dial on a radio and find a Christian station and weren't, weren't sure even after they hit it? Aha! Uh -huh. You know what I'm talking about. The sound wasn't distinct enough, was it? Why, a lot of the Christian stations, they sound just like the rock stations. And until the, the music's done and, the, and the, the announcer says, Now, wasn't that a blessing? You don't even know that it was a Christian station. There's no distinction in the sound. That's just a general rule to go by. If we're praising God, people ought to be able to tell it just from the sound that we make. There ought to be no question about it. Christian music ought to be distinct then from the world's music. And it says, if it, if it isn't that way, who will know what you're trying to say? We'll demonstrate that in a few minutes. Some of that. And then in verse 8, it says, For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? We'll look at that in just a minute or two. So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. Now, let me say this. Whether it's words, whether it's the melody, whether it's the harmony, whether it's the rhythm of music, those sounds though, are voices. When we write parts out for trumpets, we call them voicings. When we sing, of course, we call that a voice. But God says that all the kinds of voices that you can have in the world, every one of them gives a, a sign. Every one of them is a, a little signal. Like a stop sign, just four letters and a, a shape and a color, two colors. And it tells us to step on the brakes. And so with music. If we make a certain kind of sound, it gives a signal. It is significant. It means something. Don't let the gospel rockers and some of these other people tell you music doesn't have a message of its own. The Bible says so. Every voice is significant. Now let's back up just a little bit. To the trumpet giving, a, well, no, to verse 9. We want to talk about the words first. It says, Except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. Did you ever hear, did you ever hear music? Or did you ever hear somebody talk when you're already busy, busy listening to someone else? And their words just kind of go right by, in one ear and out the other? They're speaking into the air. Did you ever hear some music that was so loud you couldn't tell what the people sang even if you tried? They spoke to the air. Their message got lost. 
as far as the words are concerned. And here we find in verse 9, if we're going to have good gospel music, the words better be easy to be understood. That means that whatever we use for an accompaniment, whether it's a guitar or a drum or a piano or an orchestra, or whether it's just the choir singing, if someone's singing something important, everything else ought to be quiet enough so we can understand the words. And if there's too much noise, that's the wrong kind of music. And there's the verse. Words easy to be understood. You can give that to somebody if they're listening to music that we're, you can't quite tell what they're saying without a little sheet of the lyrics and say you, it's got to be the wrong kind of music already because the words aren't easy to understand. But here's, here's something else. When it comes to the words, some people write poetry that's so far out, that's so strange, and that's so unbiblical and unscriptural that nobody could understand what they were trying to say. Let me give you some examples that aren't real far out, but there was a song written at one time called Jesus is the Bridge Over Troubled Waters. But I could flip through all the pages in my Bible and never find out that Jesus was a bridge over troubled waters. And if I looked up trouble in the Bible, I only could see that the Lord promised to take us through the trouble. It never said that he was a bridge over the troubled waters. Now, those are kind of confusing words for a song. And... This, you would think, is, well, that just goes without saying that the words ought to be biblical if they're, if they're going to be of God. But people forget all about it. And they listen to a pretty tune, even if the words don't make any sense. I read a, a song by one fella, and he mixes up the church age with the tribulation period and the thousand-year rule and reign of Christ and even some of the little bit of the Old Testament. And you don't know what time he's talking about whenever... The songs are sung. Those words aren't easy to understand. If I'm going to give a Bible message, I've got to have Bible words. You probably haven't even noticed, but most of the new songs that are written have so little Bible in it that you couldn't be sure the person wrote it as a Christian. And they have strange doctrines in there because what they've quoted and what they've said and what they've rhymed in poetry isn't in the Bible. It's an amazing thing. I looked at a, a big, big Christian bookstore up in Canada, and we got a wedding book out. And I turned to the first song, and there were two lines in the fir first song, and one of them said, I guess the only truth that we've ever known is you and me. Now, that's pretty far away from Christianity when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I bet now whoever wrote that didn't know much Bible. My wife and me aren't true. We're false. The Lord is true. The songwriter long ago wrote, False and full of sin am I. Thou art all unrighteousness. And people let words like that get by. Well, it's a Christian song. It's in a Christian wedding book. And then later on, the fellow sang something. I guess I'm just a guy still looking for salvation. Well, then he's admitted he's not even saved. Well, that's not a Christian song. It might be an honest uh, an honest testimony from someone that they're not saved but it's sure not the testimony of a Christian and it's nothing that should be sung at a Christian wedding and that was a new song that somebody calls Christian I couldn't even tell you what the title is I'm not interested in that song not at all but words should be easy to understand I admit we have we have one problem if we try to teach what's in the Bible, there's some words in here that the average American doesn't listen to or understand or if it, and perhaps has never heard. Redemption, propitiation, words like that. They wouldn't under understand the Old Testament sacrifices. I'm not sure I understand a whole lot of things in here. And there's that song, Here I raise mine Ebenezer. But one thing's for sure, if someone wants to know what that means, Here I raise mine Ebenezer, they can look it up in the Bible and find it in the Old Testament. And as a Christian, our songs, we can't, we can't really get away from the Bible or they're not Christian songs. And so we just have to tell others, well, if you want to know what that means, let me show you here in the Bible. <coughs> I'll not say a lot about the words, but they should be easy to understand. The whole idea of a Christian singing is to give someone a message from God that's easy for that person to understand. 
Otherwise, we're just going like this, flapping our jaw into the air. It's worthless. Worthless. We need to be careful what the poetry is in our music. Well, let's look at the melody. People don't often think of the words as being too much of the music, although they are. The melody. God gave us melody to direct at protecting our spirit. That part of us that thinks. That part of us that the devil would attack with the pride of life. And melody means to praise God. Now let me show you a couple things about melody. We look at verse 8. It says, For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? Time for the army to charge. And the commanding officer says, Bugle, blow the charge. And he plays. That's an uncertain sound. I think we all knew what the bugler was trying to blow, but that's not going to be a charge, not for anybody. Every one of those soldiers says, Well, maybe I'll charge, uh, but I'm not going first. Because it wasn't a certain sound. He has to know that. Is going to be sounded with confidence, and then they'll say, "All right, that means charge." And of course, at all the basketball games, anybody that gets a horn blows up, and the whole crowd all the time hollers, "Charge!" And everybody knows those six little notes mean charge. That melody has a little message all of its own. And it is significant. It does give a sign. It does give a signal. And everywhere I go, if I play that and say, what does it tell me? The whole crowd says, charge, and they know what it says. Now, God gave us melodies to praise Him. And there's certain melodies that give out a message of praise. If I hum, mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm,
wouldn't believe the way they play today. Now, that's just a poor imitation, but you understand what I'm saying. They honk on that thing and they squawk on that thing. No wonder the preachers go, I've heard that before. We don't want a saxophone in church. They've just never heard anybody play like this. all the melody. One was suited to praising God and the other one wasn't. One had a message that was godly and one had a message that was ungodly. And I have to tell you which one is which. We're not going to get anywhere this morning. And it's based on what's in the heart of the person that's playing it. Let me illustrate it on the guitar just to make you absolutely sure that, I, that you know what I'm talking about. If I begin to play one of the songs that my wife and I like. She said, well, that's not too bad. I'll play it again. And what I'm actually playing is the last line of the song. Calvary conquered my heart. And so you would accept that. And it indeed is a line from a song that you would say is godly. On the other hand, if I pick up this same 12 string guitar and begin to play. You say, no, no, we can't praise God with that. Your spirit says no right away. If I kept on with it, you'd walk out or you'd say, preacher, get up there and get that fella out of here right now. And your spirit would, would resist that if you're saved. The reason is you recognize one melody was suited to praising God and the other melody from the same instrument played by the same person was not suited to praise God. And music is meant, melodies are meant to praise God. Melodies have a message. I think we've, we've fooled around and I don't, I, I don't think it was this school here, but we learned this in grade school. If the teacher says, now we're going to go, we're going to go on a nature walk today and we're going to see some elephants and we're going to see some butterflies. And then she'll say, now what are we looking at? Elephants or butterflies? I had one class that said those were elephants. I said, I'm not going to Africa with you. Forget it. And of course, has to be the elephants. Even if we don't know a lot about music per se, we do understand that these notes are lighter and they would represent butterflies better than elephants. Nod your head yes when I say that. And the elephants have to be down on the bottom of the keyboard because those melodies even have enough of a message that we can tell what they aren't. These are not butterflies. You'll never find a net to catch a butterfly like that. Never. Never. And so there's melodies that are written a certain way. Listen, if the songwriter writes, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. He put those notes there on purpose because he wanted them that way. They fit the words of the song and he felt that they could, he could worship God with them. Now, yet I heard someone take that melody and the black notes, you know, are written on the white paper and they say, this is where the note is and this is how long you hold it. This is where the next note is and this is how long you hold it. And there's a reason they put them on paper. They said, we want to keep the song that way. I heard someone singing, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful soul. Uh-uh. I'm glad you laughed. You laugh or cry, one of the two. But that's not love lifted me. That's not how it goes. And I've often demonstrated that even at the chorus, they have a high note, love, and then lifted me. 
And, I, and I've shown how love was the highest note, and then lifted was a low note to a high note, just like I was picking something up. Lifted me, love, lifted me. On purpose, whether the songwriter meant it or not, it came out to be the right melody. It painted picture of the text, and it was good. Oh, there's so much more that we could say, but let me go on. Let me go on. If you don't have a melody, that will help paint a picture of the height and the depth and the breadth and the width and the, uh, God's love and mercy. You don't have the right kind of melody. Melody should be able to plunge down to the depths of hell, like David said. If I make my bed in hell. And then he said, if I take the wings of a dove, it ought to be able to soar up. When, when we're excited, we sing higher notes. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. And there's something beautiful about a melody that will rise and fall and get excited. And others that will tone way down soft. But they all paint pictures. Well, let's look at the harmony once. Let's look at the harmony. You know, in the, in the dance music and in the modern gospel music, that there's a lot of sounds on the piano that are employed that probably should never be employed. Well, I know they shouldn't be. God gave us some basic things. Now, here's what we call a major triad. God made three notes fit together and make a beautiful major chord, we call it. We learned that in grade school. Happy notes. Happy notes. And minor chords, three different kinds of notes put together. They're more sad, more serious. And so forth. But men have discovered they can combine a whole bunch of notes together and play things like this. And make strange sounds. And they can pile notes together. And they can make sounds that'll make your hair stand on end, and give you a headache. Harmony has a message too, doesn't it? Those sounds are significant. If someone said, this is a song and I call it headache number two, you wouldn't believe them. That is not a headache. No way. That's peaceful sounding. Now, God's given us harmonies so we might be able to speak of the peace of God. And notes come to a final end, don't they? What if, what if I ended a song like this? Then, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Not quite, huh? Or worse than that, how great thou art. Came to rest, didn't it? It finally came. God made music and harmony so that it finally will come to rest and be peaceful. Because for the Christian, someday, all the turmoil of this life is going to be over. And we'll be in the new Jerusalem and we'll have peace and rest forevermore. And God gave us the right kind of harmonies. Oh, no. You know, when I was lost, I like those biting harmonies sometimes. I like to just play things on the guitar that would, would drive everybody that was sane crazy. And make everybody that was crazy comfortable. But not anymore. Not anymore. Those harmonies are, are made to affect us. I like to tell about the old time movies. Because they illustrated so well. They'd hire a man to play the keyboard to say what the, the old movies couldn't say. Because they had no words. And it was amazing how the, the pianist would catch on to the flavor of things. Always if there, there was a hero in the movie. And they would have a major key, a major chord, playing a happy melody that was very heroic. And every time the hero came out, and you knew it had to be good. 
He was handsome and muscular and wavy hair and everything, sunburned armpits, the whole business, you know how that. And then there was a beautiful, a beautiful maiden with a flower in her mouth, and she would dance around on the stage and uh, sway back and forth and just do nothing but look beautiful. She could have been dumb, but it didn't matter. She was beautiful, and she wandered around the room and won the heart of our hero. But every time she came out on the stage, one of these little beautiful music box melodies, you know. And so the pianist described the character of those people. Of course, there was a villain. That melody's in a minor key, and there's something not good about that. <coughs> and whenever he came around, and you knew it could be no good. He told the beautiful young lady that, he'd ha that she had to marry him or he, or he would take away the ranch. And she said, I'd rather die than marry you. And so he said, all right, you shall die. And he tied her up to a railroad track. And that brings in our fourth character. The piano player had to think, now, how am I going to describe a train? I know how to describe a villain. I know how to describe a hero. I know how to describe a hero. But how do I describe a train? And, and he began to think and thought, I know what? We're going to use a fully diminished seventh chord. Nobody cares what it's called. But that has a name. And musicians know what it is. And he thought, well, how am I going to describe that train coming down the track closer and closer to that gal tied up on the track? He said, I know what? I'm going to use that chord and we're going to sound just like we're going choo, 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 choo. And the louder, the louder it got and the faster it would go, the closer you'd know the train was. And that's how they described what went on. Well, what, what continued to go on when this gal was tied up on the track is a, a not so merry chase between the hero and the villain. So they used notes uh, in a minor key again. Moving at a rapid pace so you could feel them running and running and chasing each other, trying to throw each other off a cliff or a tall building. And this would go on, but they had to show you what was happening to the girl. Well, the train was on the horizon already, and it was getting closer. So they played the diminished chords again. You know what those diminished chords do? They make people bite their nails and sit on the edge of their chair and go, ah, and ladies to faint and all that kind of stuff. And if you keep playing them and playing, it works up the emotions so much. You see, harmony is geared for the soul of man. Where the lust of the eyes enters in. And God gave us the right harmonies to protect that. Peaceful harmonies, beautiful harmonies. But here's the choo choo train. And we got to look at these guys chasing each other again. Train. Getting closer. They're still chasing. Train. So everybody's on the edge of their seat and finally scream, Oh, she's going to die. And right about that time, the good guy pushed the bad guy over the side of a hill and runs and pulls with one sweep, gets that rope off of her and sets her free. And of course, you hear this. And you know he's got her rescued and that train goes by and you don't hear any more of the choo-choo. But by then, the people were all worked up. And you know what? Next week, they come back again and put another nickel in the, in the, at the front door there so they could get in and watch the same movie. They just repaint the train with another number on it, you know. And spray the hero's hair a little bit and change the black cape on the bad guy to another black cape. But, you know, they used harmonies. A couple simple melodies and a lot of harmony. Sweet harmonies for the lady. Majestic harmonies for the hero. Evil minor melodies and harmonies for the villain. And then those diminished chords for that choo-choo train just sets you on edge. And they could build up their audiences to a fever pitch. I can't imagine watching that same movie over and over and over and over and over again. But they did it because they loved to have their feelings affected by those harmonies. And that's how harmony works. <coughs> now, when it comes to rhythm, that's the most important because it affects... It affects the style of the entire song. I have always said, just to make it real plain, there's three parts to rhythm. And I'll give them to you real quickly. Three parts to a beat that makes it a dance song instead of a march song. Number one is a boogie woogie. Number two is a back beat. And number three is a break beat. If you can hear those three things in a song, you don't want to, you don't want to worship God with them. You say, well, how will I recognize? Boogie woogie is easy because 
Kids, I don't, I don't know why this song goes on and on, but kids always get on the piano before they know how to play it, and they'll go... How many have heard it? Yeah, be honest, be honest. And that's, that's an old dirty song called Heart and Soul. And that's a boogie-woogie rhythm. It's do 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 like... See, that's a rhythm. Not those set of notes, but that's a rhythm. And they called that the boogie-woogie. That eight to the bar makes a body want to dance. If you hear that in gospel music or something close to that, that is not gospel music. I changed it a little bit, but if we sing, I am weak, but thou art strong. That's not gospel music. It might be good for Elvis, and it might be good for Jimmy Swaggart, and a whole bunch of other folks, but that's not gospel music. That's boogie-woogie rhythm, and it makes the body want to dance. That's not gospel music. Now, that just so happens, and preachers cringe too when someone says, I'm going to play guitar in church. Ah, same thing as if it's a saxophone. They cringe because they know that most guitar players, without maybe even knowing what they're doing anymore, get on the guitar and they start to strum down, up, down, up, down. They're strumming a the boogie. And then they'll sing, I owed a debt I could not pay. And it was growing every day. But Jesus paid it all for me. And so forth. That's not gospel music. That's boogie-woogie with some Bible words. But that's not gospel music. So that's what the boogie is. If I take any more time, we won't finish. Let me give you what the backbeat is. We add it to the boogie-woogie, it just fits. And it's an accent on beat two and beat four. That's what Chuck Berry said, rock and roll guitarist. He said, I dig that rock and roll music. It's got a backbeat. You can't lose it. And so rock music always is accent two and four. One, two, three, four. One, two. One, two, three, four, so forth. That's the opposite of a march. A march goes one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, and that makes music march. The backbeat makes music into rock and roll. Chuck Berry said so, and that's the truth. An accent on beat two and four. Snare drummer played boom, bop, boom, bop, boom, bop, bop, boom. Bop, all the way through. The third part, third part, is called a break beat. A break beat is just syncopation, offbeat music they used to call it. Sometimes they call it upbeat music because it wasn't on the beat, it was off the beat. And it made the body want to dance. Some people thought that was a good term, if they could be upbeat people. Meaning putting the accent in the wrong place. All it meant was the ungodly crowd that wanted to go downtown and dance. That's all it meant. That's all it's ever meant. In a rumba. That second note that I'm playing. Ba, 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 ba. It's off the beat. And it helps the body to dance. So if you've got too much syncopation in a song, it's going to turn it into a, a, a dance tune. Elvis Presley liked to play his rock and roll that way with that underneath. So forth. Those are dance rhythms. Drummers used to know what they're called. They don't know what they're called anymore. But whether, whether you've got, you know, folk music or rock and roll, whether you've got Dixieland jazz or big band music or reggae or rap or disco or any other kind of rock or any other kind of entertainment music, you're going to have that boogie-woogie eight to the bar. You're going to have that backbeat accent on two and four. And you're going to have that offbeat syncopation in the voices, in the instruments, on the drums, and everything. And those don't belong in gospel music. Let me just give you one illustration. We're done here. But a song, a gospel song may go, uh, Who can cheer the heart like Jesus by His presence all divine? And you hear piano players playing, Who can cheer the heart like Jesus by His presence all divine. All they're doing is imitating drums. Boom, 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 boom. And you know that message isn't for the Spirit. That message is not godly. There are certain rhythms that you can use. Every piece of music in that hymn book in 4-4 four, four time is a march. 
and it teaches us to be Christian soldiers. But if the music starts to dance with the boogie woogie, with the backbeat or the breakbeat, it's not gospel music anymore. It's giving another message. Even if the words are godly, it's no longer godly. So, if we ask the question, how, how do you understand what good music is? It ought to sound different than the rock station. It ought to sound different than the old band music, too, big band music. It ought to sound different than the entertainment music. It ought to sound different than the easy listening station at the restaurants. It ought to be distinct. You know, when we sing those gospel songs in a good old-fashioned way, they don't sound like anything else the world sings. That's the way we need to keep them. We need to make a certain sound so people will prepare themselves to the battle. Do we want to raise up missionaries and preachers and Sunday school teachers and bus workers and soul winners and prayer warriors? Yes, we do. Then we need to have music that gives a certain sound. And it doesn't matter how old-fashioned it is as long as it's true to the Word of God and true to the Spirit of our God. We want to look to make sure we've got pure words, beautiful melodies. We worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Beautiful harmonies that bring peace, that speak peace. And stirring rhythms, maybe, yes, but they ought to be march-type rhythms. Nothing you can dance to. You feel like dancing, you've got the wrong kind. Those sounds are significant. We can never portray the peace of the Lord with wild, discordant, and violent sounds. We can never speak of the Lord's compassion if we've got cold music, careless music, unconcerned music. Never speak of the love of God with hateful music, the goodness of the Lord with bad music. Never speak of the majesty of God with low-class music. Never speak of the power of God with puny music. Never speak of the wisdom of God with stupid music. Never speak of the holiness of God with unholy music. Never speak of godliness with ungodly music. Never speak of heavenly, mu heavenly things with earthly, sensual, and devilish music. Never speak of the seriousness of the cross and hell and salvation with flippant music. Or the sacrifice of our Savior with selfish music. Never portray that which should be beautiful with ugly music. Never try to depict joy with sorrowful music. Never speak of gentleness with boisterous music. Never speak of what's in the heart of God with half-hearted or heartless music. Never speak of the greatness of our God with bass music. And we could never speak of being a soldier if we use dance music. Father, thank you for the time we've had. We pray that it will help. In Jesus' name, bless what's to come. I'm looking forward to it, dear Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello, I'm S.M. Davis from Lincoln, Illinois, with Biblical Alternatives for Christian Families to help with problems that we see in many families in our day. I've noticed that there are four problem areas for Christian families that are causing them to lose their children or at least have problems with those children, their children. Uh, those areas are music, clothing, friends, and the boyfriend-girlfriend philosophy of our day. We have videotapes, audio tapes, and booklets that hopefully will help you in that area, in each of those areas. Uh, the first tape I would mention to you, this is the first of four tapes, is entitled Seeds of Disintegration Planted by the Boyfriend-Girlfriend Philosophy. And this shows that the boyfriend-girlfriend philosophy of our day is clearly flawed and is carrying our young people into mental, emotional, and spiritual captivity. The boyfriend-girlfriend game of our day is an idol. And before you can build an altar to the true God, any idols must be torn down. This message tears down the idol of the boyfriend-girlfriend philosophy. The second message then tells people what to do, because after uh, you find out that you're not playing the boyfriend-girlfriend game, then you need to know what to do. God's plan for finding a mate, dating, courting, or betrothing. Uh, I suspect I have way over a thousand hours of study in this one message, hour and fifty minutes long, and it gives a clear biblical approach for families to follow to get from couples from being single 
uh, to being a couple. It's profusely illustrated with uh, wedding pictures and movies of my daughter's engagements, betrothing appointments, and so on. The third message, the third videotape or audio tape, um, is entitled, Victory Over the Dating Spirit. And this tells how to keep the commitments that were made in the first two videos. And then the fourth one ties up all the Lucian's questions and answers about betrothing. And then one of the most common problems of our day, both from dedicated Christian families as well as some who are not so dedicated, is the problem of teenage rebellion. This message has had a very wide circulation now. It's entitled, Changing the Heart of a Rebel. Only in the last few days again, I heard from a father who said that he was able to reach his 17-year-old daughter who didn't want to do anything she wanted him to do, and now she is 19. That was two years ago, and she, he said, we're so happy we heard that message when we did. This message, as well as um, the previous message, uh, God's Plan for Finding a Mate, are both in booklet form as well as video or audio tape. Then there is a message that uh, is primarily to young people entitled, My Son, Give Me Thine Heart. This is a, I call it a fiery camp meeting style message, uh, fiery camp meeting style preaching. Not everyone will appreciate uh, the style of preaching of this message. Uh, most people don't have a problem with the other messages. Some uh, don't relate as well to this, but uh, this, is a bit, this message God has used with a lot of teenagers to show them that they need to give their heart to their parents and their pastor. After I preached this at a nationwide youth conference in 1990, young people were lined up at the telephone calling home to get things right with their parents. And then uh, several messages on uh, what to do with your children, how to train up a child in the way he should go, teaches what Proverbs 22, 6 means, and gives steps to follow to keep children on the proper path. It includes a list of things to watch out for that will get children off the path and then lines up with a list of proper goals for parents in relation to their children. Most of these videotapes, incidentally, have captivating on-screen graphics that will help hold your attention and your children's attention as you watch them uh, together or watch them apart. Uh, this is one of my favorite messages, how to develop the right appetites in your children. Since a child is going to follow spiritual or worldly appetites, it is vitally important that those appetites be properly chosen and cultured and controlled. This shows that children do better when kept on a simple butter and honey diet. And then a very, very important message, what the Bible has to say about spanking. Uh, this gives truths about spanking unknown to most Christians. In fact, a father who was unexpectedly bit checked by state officials said, I'm so glad I heard your message and changed my methods before they came. Uh, this tells why to spank, when to spank, how to spank. Tremendously important. I wish I had time right here to tell you about it. And what to expect after a proper biblical spanking. We're not as likely to have problems with the state or others if we spank biblically. Uh, a message that God has used to help a lot of husbands. Christ, the husband's example, shows that a husband with Christ as his example is far more likely to have a happy, radiant wife and a godly, peace-filled home. And then a message on clothing that shows that the most important clothing for any Christian is the clothing of righteousness and humility for the soul. It gives a precise biblical study of proper and improper clothing for men and women. Once you get the heart right, then you want to know what God has to say about how to dress outwardly. If we don't correct this area, then we're going to continue to have massive problems with our children. A message on problem solving, telling people how to deal with the problems that they have among themselves, nothing shall offend them. The only message that I carry that I have not personally preached is by uh, music evangelist Alan Ives, who uses several different instruments to tactfully and graciously and clearly show the right and wrong kind of music. It's entitled, How to Tell the Right Kind of Music. We're going to continue to have problems with our young people unless we get this area right. And then a lot of people are confused uh, about how, what to do with a rebellious child uh, a lot of people don't know how to let go of a rebellious child, or that is, they let go when they shouldn't, and they don't let go properly when they should. This is a follow-up message 
to changing the heart of a rebel. The thoughts will challenge you knowing when to let go. And um, then the message dealing with life's emotional roller coaster. Few things in life are as wonderful as emotions, but few things can get a Christian in as much trouble as their emotions. Christians cannot ignore their emotions, but biblically they must learn to control them. Then we have another video entitled, How to Build a Strong Marriage. And uh, we have a couple of, a number of audio tapes, in particular, uh, an audio tape entitled, What to Expect from a 12-Year-Old that Gives the Character Traits that Need to be in a Child by the Time He is 12 Years of Age. And then a message entitled, Breaking Family Curses. Our toll-free number, if you'd like to call us, is 800 588 -53. God bless you and your family and your home and your life.